Okay, so for our first talk of the afternoon, Daniel Liu, an historian. I have to say that Liu, Liu, Liu how do we pronounce it? I, won't say. <laughs> I, have, to say, I have to say when I was uh, design, when we were designing this uh, this workshop with Shao, Shao says we have to invite historians. We have to invite these at least one historian in every workshop because, because historians are great. That's what happens when you hire me. Sorry. Say, and it, and I, 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 I'm an HPA guy too, so I, 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 I was really happy to uh, happy to comply. I have to say that. Daniel was less keen because he was not sure how he could contribute to 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 a philosophy uh, on causation. But of course, usually historians underrate themselves. So we will listen Daniel discussing ending epigenesis cell and protoplasm as developmental agents, 1828 to 1850. Gosh, I gave you a set of dates that I didn't hold to at all. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, anyway, that's a, that's a, that's a, oh, wow. that's a historian's <laughs> problem. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much, Alexandra and Charles, for inviting me. It's uh, really lovely to be here. Um, I, in my defense, I feel like I know something about causation, but I don't know what ontic causation is, and maybe you can still help me out with that a little bit. Um, so, uh, I work on, I have a project right now that's funded by the German Research Foundation on the history of the first century of cell and protoplasm theory. Now, people, actually, can I get a show of hints? Do, do most of you know the basic history of cell theory? Like, when cell theory started? No? Okay, no is a good answer. I will, that, that is an answer I can work with. So, um, right, most of us know what cells are, but what it was protoplasm. And one of, the, one of my big points in the project is that these two theories together were important to think about um, uh, as two parts of one larger theory in this first century. So around 1900, you would have said that there were three or four foundational theories in, the, in, in biology. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is the really obvious one. Cell theory is still fundamental for us today. They would have also said protoplasm theory. And some people would have also added Heckel's biogenetic law <coughs> that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Uh, now, what was protoplasm theory? And the past tense is important here. So protoplasm theory, at its most basic, held that there was a certain part of the cell that was alive, and that that part was referred to as the living substance or living matter in many different languages. So here's Ernst Heckel writing in 1868, quote, one of the greatest achievements in modern biology and one of the richest in results is the protoplasm theory of the Sarkozy theory. The theory that the protein contents of animal and plant cells are identical and that in both cases, this proteinaceous material is the original active substrate of all vital phenomena. Uh, T.H. Huxley had this famous uh, formulation whereby protoplasm was the physical basis of life. Quote, even those who are aware that matter and life are inseparably connected may not be prepared for the conclusion plainly suggested by the phrase physical basis or matter of life that there is some kind of matter which is common to all <coughs> living beings. Uh, Claude, Bernard, uh, Claude Bernard in 1878 wrote, quote, that the living matter independent of all form, amorphous or rather monomorphous, is the protoplasm. Nevertheless, protoplasm is not yet a living being. It lacks a form that characterizes the distinct being. It is uh, the ideal matter of the living being or the agent of life. It exhibits to us in the state of nakedness in whatever is universal and persistent throughout its varieties and its forms. The famous 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica, if you look in the entry Life, it merely said Life, the popular name for the activity peculiar to protoplasm. And to indicate that the concept about 30 years later was either dead or retired, 
If you look in the 1848 edition of the same encyclopedia, it says merely life, see biology. <laughs> Um, so in the project, one of my main goals is, try, is to try to track this development from being a central theory in biology to being not even worth discussing uh, in a simple encyclopedia. But today, I want to focus on this period here, the 1840s. What happened in the 1840s to make this concept come about? Now, obviously, term was invented then, this was the first decade of the cell theory, but I was trying to come up with better reasons for why I should start a historical investigation at this particular moment. So in the project of a, as a whole, I have two main arguments, um, and the first is borrowed by from Hans Jörg Reinberger, that biologists constantly confronted the limitations of the optical microscope first by studying the microscope as a physical system, and second by analyzing their microtechnique. So the suite of dissection, fixation, staining, and preservation techniques required for biological microscopy. And so Karen, the, what I was talking about earlier, you have the tool, and then you have methods and methodologies. Right? So that's, that's a distinction that is, is important. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, the big empirical portion of, uh, of what I want to present to you today is early cell theory, how did it come about? And in particular, I'm going to pay attention to two parts of early debates in cell theory. When Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann came up with cell theory in 1838, their theory for how cells generated was called free cell formation or freie cell and the, the basics of the theory was that the, was that the nucleus first coagulates out from a, from a structure, a substance, and then the cell as a whole coagulates around the nucleus. Now obviously now, we, with a couple of rare exceptions, we don't hold this to be true. Now we hold that cells multiply by division. And this was the theory that came along in the 1840s, but only in a very protracted way. And I'm going to show you some of the difficulties that it faced. Um, when I originally pitched this talk to Alessandro, I, I was thinking I would make these two strong arguments, but I'm going to make them moderate suggestions instead. <laughs> right? So I'm going to, su to moderately suggest that cell and protoplasm theory together marked the end of an older era of biology in which the concept of life itself was defined by its identity with organization and the transcendental causes of that organization. For example, vital forces or potentialities. And uh, for those of you who know your Kant, this is the Kantian argument. I'm going to further art, mildly, moderately suggest that cell division and protoplasm theory mark the beginning of a modern age in biology in which the concept of life becomes indexed to matter theory. So essentially, that you make it possible for T.H. Huxley to say, physical basis or material of life. Um, I have three terminological points to make, two and a half. I'm going to say, like, botanist is going to make sense. I'm going to say the word anatomist to refer to medical anatomists, anatomists, pathologists, and comparative zoologists as, as a group. I'm also, when I'm going to talk about cell plant cells, I'm going to use the words membrane and wall interchangeably. And if you want to know more about that, I can uh, tell you a lot about that if you want. Okay, having said that, in any standard outlines of the history of cell theory, you'll get at best all three of these points and usually two or two out of the three. Right? So in the standard outline of the history of cell theory, Matthias Schleiden in 1838 comes up with a plant cell theory. He meets with Theodor Schwann and Theodor Schwann generalizes the plant cell theory to be true for plants and animals, and that's published in 1839. Second, either in 1841, or in 1842, or in 1844, or in 1846, or in 1851, or 54, or 55, um, Carl Nagley or some other botanist <laughs> um, suggests that plant cells divide. And then Robert Remock, 
1851, or 52, or 54, or 55, declares that animal cells divide, and Rudolf Virchow in 1855 popularizes the doctrine omnis cellula a cellula, a every cell from every other cell. Right? I looked at um, Jan Sapp's Genesis was in a history of biology textbook. I looked at Ilse Jans Geschichte der Biologie, the third edition, which is ex excellent. I looked at Francois Jacot's, um, what's the title of that in French, La Logique de Vivant. And they all only have two of the three. So I'm going to give you a lot more than the two of the three today. All right. So the idea that, uh, the idea of cells and pores as being a feature in biological. Um, biological structure, of course, came from Robert Hooke's Micrographia in 1665. From 1665 until 1803, anatomists would say that something had a cellular texture or that something was cellular as an adjective. It would have made no sense for anyone to say that something was made of cells until 1803 because this a cell was not an individual unit. This only happened in 1803 with Jean-Pierre Vaucher's Histoire de Conferve, um, in which he took filamentous algae, shook them apart into individual, what he called les loges, and said that these were individualized, uh, individualized plants, complete with the powers of metabolism and reproduction. By the 1830s, botanists had generally agreed that there were two or three different kinds of fundamental units in plants. Cells, spiral fibers, and elongated vessels. Right? So uh, Julius Mayen said there were these three kinds. Some people said that there were only cells and vessels. Some people said there were only cells and fibers. Some people thought, uh, actually did think that cells were basically what you had. But these were the three. In anatomy, does anyone want to take a guess for how many different fundamental units they had? Anyone? So Javier Bichat in 1801 in the, uh, in the Anatomy Generale proposes 21 different tissue types as being fundamental to the animal body. Right? Um, of which number one was the cellular system of tissue. This started to change in anatomy and botany alike um, as, more, uh, as more biologists started to notice the existence of the nucleus. The first major work on the, on the natural history of the cell nucleus was by the Czech anatomist Jan Burkinja, um, who studied what he called the scar or the germinal vesicle of chickens in the chicken cell. And we now recognize that he was, in fact, looking at and studying the nucleus. The term nucleus comes from Robert Brown in either 1831 or 1833, depending on how you count it, um, in which he, uh, stu he was study conducting a study of the reproduction of orchids and incidentally ma mentioned uh, that he thought that the nucleus was a structure common in cells across the entire organism. Right? So this is noticing the ubiquity and commonality of the nucleus. Um, he also thought uh, that the nucleus had something to do with pollen. So this is an image of pollen um, and the process of fertilization in plants. But he seems to have only talked about this in private conversation. He never published this. So the immediate catalyst for cell <coughs> as a whole occurred when Robert Brown traveled to Berlin to meet Alexander von Humboldt and the botanist Jon uh, Johann Horkel. Horkel was, um, had a student who was also his nephew named Matthias Schleiden, who also happened to be studying plant reproduction in the process of fertilization. We know that Schleiden and Humboldt both were particularly thrilled by, by Brown's visit to Berlin, and Brown was apparently so impressed by Schleiden and Schleiden's Berlin-made microscope that he bought one for himself before he left for his next stop in Vienna. For the next year, Schleiden refocused his research on the plant ovaries, the pollen, and the process of reproduction, following Brown's advice and paying particular attention to the nucleus. In October 1837, a year after meeting Brown, Schleiden met with Theodor Schwann, a student of the great physiologist Johannes Muller. 
Schleiden told Schwann about his research on cell nuclei. They got very excited. And Schwann took Schleiden to the anatomical theater of the University of Berlin, where he looked at cell nuclei in Schwann's preparations of embryonic frog, uh, frog cartilage. In the spring of 1838, Schleiden published this his version of the theory as an article in Johannes Muller's The Archive for, the, for Anatomy, Physiology, and Wissenschaftliche Medizin, which, if you think about it, is kind of a weird place to publish a botany article. <clears throat> um, Schwann was faced with, a, uh, faced with a larger empirical challenge and published his book in four installments, the first of which was delivered in, the, in August 1838. So, in summary, there were four parts of the Schleiden and Schwann cell. The first one was uncontroversial to, to any. The cell consists of a membrane enclosing a nucleus. This is the definition of the cell. The second two points would have been common or well understood for botanists, but would have been very challenging to anatomists. First, that cells are biological individuals, and that all plants and animals are ultimately composed of cells, that the cell is the only fundamental unit for all living organisms. Finally, they both agreed that cells are generated from the nucleus, from the nucleus in a cytoblastema by free cell formation, that is, by coagulation. This would have been very familiar to anatomists, but was slightly less familiar in botany. And this will become apparent as I keep going. So what was the cell theory in their own words? Um, if you look at passage two on the handout. So here's Schleiden speaking, right. Each cell leads a double life, an entirely independent one belonging to its own development alone, and an incidental one insofar that it has become an integrated part of the plant. Here's how he describes how cells form. In the pollen tube and the ovule, minute mucus granules originate in the gum, upon which a thus far homogeneous solution of gum becomes opalescent or even opaque within the larger mass of granules. Single, larger, more sharply defined granules here in figure two uh, now become very apparent in this mass. Very soon afterwards, the cytoblasts occur. That was his word for the nucleus down here. Um, appearing as granular coagulations around the granules. As soon as the cytoblasts have attained their full size, a delicate transparent vesicle rises upon their surface. This is the young cell. Right, so he proceeds in figure one to show how you initially start with a solution of gum in which the cyto cytoplasts coagulate, and then the cells start to balloon outwards until they reach their full size, and then they mature by hardening uh, here in figure nine. Okay. Um, Schwann basically takes this and even just quotes Schleiden often in his own book. So passage number four. There is, in the first instance, a structureless substance present, which is sometimes quite fluid, at others more or less gelatinous. <coughs> this substance possesses within itself, in a greater or lesser measure, according to its chemical qualities and the degree, degree of its vitality, a capacity to occasion the production of cells. When this takes place, the nucleus usually appears to be formed first. That's figure 12 here and then a cell around it, figure 11 here. The cell, when once formed, continues to grow by its own individual powers, but is at the same time directed by the influence of the entire organism in such manner as the design of the whole requires. This is the fundamental phenomenon of all animal and plant vegetative growth. We will name this substance in which the cells are formed the cell germinating material or cytoplasty. So to reiterate the cells, sorry, um, it is important for us, for us to realize that this is a theoretical schema because technologically speaking, neither Schleiden nor Schwann could have been observing this under the microscope in real time. This was not a problem of optical quality. It only has to do with the fact that these tissues um, had to be cut thinly enough to be transparent and therefore usable as a microscope specimen. Only then can the microscope hope 
that the section is sufficiently uninjured um, that they look like they are in a natural state. Furthermore, once extracted, there's a finite time um, to observe the specimen before it dries out or decays. Therefore, seeing a process like cell formation was a matter of making many discrete observations and inferring a sequence. There was no way for anyone to watch in real time a cell dividing or generating out of the cytoplastema. Our visual culture in the 20th and now 21st centuries has primed us to imagine mitosis and fission in cinematic or stop motion style. In the 19th century, not only biologists lack uh, not only did biologists lack the technology to, to produce motion pictures of living cells in action, biologists inferred the sequence of cellular life by examining prepared specimens that would ultimately cumulatively show the life, cellular life's many stages. Every time we see a sequence in a diagram and read a description of a sequential process, we need to understand it as having come out of the scientist's visual system as a whole. And thus we need to understand it as an argument for how to link discrete observations to discrete objects. Thus, in 1842, Schleiden openly admitted to having never seen cell multiplication himself, that he had, quote, never been so fortunate as to observe a complete series of cells in this course of development. All of these images, in other words, need to be read as schematic and argumentative unless explicitly indicated, they cannot be viewed as serial observations of one object in development. Together with the text, these kinds of images are arguments by their authors that these many observations of many individual objects ought to be interpreted as stages in a developmental series. Now, historical retrospective has not been kind to Schleiden and Schwann at all. Um, already in 1875, you could, uh, you could read that, quote, one will hardly find a single correct observation in Schleiden's theory. On the 100th anniversary of the cell theory, John Carling wrote that it was fantastic and erroneous, purely a hypothesis spun out of midair. And Jen Sapp, in the text of Genesis from 2003, wrote, quote, if much, if, if much of what is credited to Schleiden and Schwann has been stated by others before them, and if their assertions about the generation of cells was simply wrong, why are they credited as founders of cell theory? <clears throat> um, but I would argue that we have to remember that from 1838 to at least 1846, about two or three, um, almost a decade, I'm not doing math very well today, Schleiden and Schwann's cell theories were greeted enthusiastically and free cell formation was widely accepted. Now, um, nor did Schleiden and Schwann simply come up with this on their own. They relied on a very familiar schema of generation as a process of coagulation and development. So Schleiden said that plant cells are generated in gum, sugar, or starch, which is a whole other talk. I'll get bored to tears with that one, uh, if you ask me in q &A. Um, Schwann, by contrast, used this weird term, cytoblastema. And aside from calling it a gelatinous structureless substance, he was very evasive about its other qualities. I was very surprised when I realized that no other historian has bothered to look for where this term cytoblastema comes from, even though a lot has been written on Schwann, so I, I went and looked. And what I found was that if you took the cyto off of the word and just looked for blastema, the first person <coughs> who used this word was Johannes Muller, Schwann's, uh, Schwann's teacher, the one who published the cell theory, uh, Schleiden's cell theory, and one of the most important comparative physiologists of his, of his time. Um, it is a vaguely Greek term that he used as, the German, as, a, uh, as a term to substitute for the German Keimstoff. So here's passage six. Every organized body is composed of fluids and of solids. There are, the first are, in one point of view, the materials, and in the other, I'm sorry, that's not, uh, number five. In the embryo, the germinal material, time shock of an organ, which we have called the blastema, the nature of this germinal material can be seen particularly clearly in the development of the glands. In the glands, it is a gelatinous, semi-transparent matter. It forms a kind of atmosphere around the glandular tubules, which is initially very diffuse and is absorbed by the glandular system as it grows. 
right? And in eight, five years earlier, in 1830, he simply calls the primordial material a gelatinous material. Muller's, through Muller's influence, the term blastema became quite common in 1830s physiology. Um, we find many invocations of it by many other physiologists, including by Gabriel Valentin. How, uh, so this is passage set on the handout. Quote, the blastema consists of a gelatinous or gummy mass, tenacious, uniform, transparent, homogenous, and embedded in, the larger, in larger or smaller granules. This blastomatic mass in every bud of the plant embryo is contained in the center, which according to the authority of C.F. Wolf, we call the point of vegetation. Thus, the terms blastema and Keimstoff had very little theoretical content. It was merely a gelatinous precursor material that coagulated into tissues and organs during development. Schwann never bothered to explain the site of blastema in terms of its chemistry or structure, and Muller never bothered to explain the blastema in terms of its chemistry or structure either. This was, I would argue, a legacy of the epigenetic theories of biological development going well back into the 18th century, back to Caspar Friedrich Wolff, back to Blumenbach, back to Kant, and, and the German romantic biologists as well. And there happens to be a gigantic literature Right, all of the philosophy of the organism people will go back to Kant, if not earlier. Right, and that's about half of this list here. Um, to, um, the literature on this tends to frame this in terms of the epigenesis versus preformation debates. And to really radically oversimplify this, inspired from the first microscopic studies of microorganisms, in the first part of the 18th century, physiologists tried to in introduce Cartesian mechanics to explain generation. That is, they used matter in motion as the proximate material cause. The best Cartesian explanation, explanation for biological generation was preformation. That is, that God the clockmaker puts each embryo inside of every other embryo. This is the, um, this is the famous term emboitement, or for chachelon. And then the history of nature starts, and at some finite po point in the future, the history of nature will end with the judgment. <laughs> um, I'm still surprised that anyone thought this was a good idea. <laughs> um, and that was what happened in the late 18th century as well. So in the late second half of the 18th century, anyone who was unsatisfied with this preformation theory started to develop immaterial theories of the causes of generation. So they posited vital forces, the inner drive, ensoulment, divine intervention, the list goes on and on. And I would argue that one of the reasons there's so much scholarship on this is because biologists in this period had lots and lots of, of options to explore once they all agreed that matter theory did not provide the answers they were looking for. Um, that matter theory was too impoverished to explain something as complicated and recurring as generation and reproduction. The blastema is just a fluid, and Ohad Parnas here as a historian gives this list of something like a dozen different names that a dozen different biologists gave to this fluid, all of which were unorganized, simple, structuralists, and themselves not alive. By the 1820s, the, as historians have shown, German morphologists, by and large, held to epigenetic theories of development. But rather than talk about vital forces, um, they, developed, they simply described developmental sequences and sought to derive general laws of development by induction. By and large, they also stopped talking about causes. So what Schleiden and Schwann did was they took a very familiar and widely accepted explanatory schema of coagulation of unorganized non-living fluid and focus it down to the cellular level. That is all free cell information was. The claim, however, was not just that cells were the fundamental units of plant and animal life, but that free cell formation was the general law of development as such. 
When biologists eventually started to propose cell division in the 1840s, they were aware that they were challenging not just a part of cell theory, but also the prevailing epigenetic theory of generation as a whole. And they did so with roughly the same methodological strictures that Schleiden and Schwann faced, namely the challenge of crafting a developmental argument from discrete rather than serial observation. The first claim that plant cells divide came from the botanist Hugo Moll in 1835. So this is three years before Schleiden and Schwann. However, during this period, botanists had more or less an understanding that there were many ways for cells to generate, and Moll added division to a pile of existing ones. So Moll examined filamentous algae and basically argued <coughs> that you never see half-grown cells in a filamentous al alga, but you do see these bumps, these humps, and these protrusions. And at some point, you will also see um, branching off from the main filament another protrusion, but this time with a dividing wall. He conjectured that um, he argued that they go, that the sequence goes in this order, from a hump to a bump to a projection to a divided cell. Right? So this is passage eight on the handout. This is, note the passive voice in this passage. A constriction appears, protruding in the interior of the cell, which constricts the green mass inside the alpha filament, i.e. a ring-shaped partition that is perforated in Um, in 1841, now this is three years after Schleiden and Schwann's theory, the botanist Franz Unger um, was, became the first to botanist to voice some objections to free cell formation. In 1844, he produced these diagrams, which I find incredibly unconvincing, in which he says that these partitions here, they seem thinner than the rest of them. So I think Mole's scheme of, of division might hold for other plants as well. Right? This is a very short comment almost in the, uh, in the context of a larger, larger discussion. Uh, you can say, see the sim a similar thing happens in anatomy. So famously, Robert Remock in 1841 becomes the first anatomist to reject free cell formation. Um, although he wasn't able to publish this diagram until 1841, sorry, 1851, 10 years later. And you'll notice, this is not a developmental sequence. These are individual observations of thing, objects which he claims are cells caught in the middle of dividing. Right? This, is not a, this is not a process diagram. When we play the historian's game of who said it first, we point to, Bob, uh, to Unger in 1841 and Remark. The, the dates vary because most people don't read all of Remock. Um, uh, let's see. This highly descriptive approach was typical for gener German biologists. Oh, I have an old version of my talk. Um, the, the theory of cell division was first, sorry, let me, let me go back a step. So how did this change? I would argue, my apologies, I would argue that I should have the right version of my text. Um, of any botanist who was active in the 1830s and 40s, the one best prepared to examine Schleiden's theory in detail was Hugo Moll. In a, his 1835 theory of cell division was well known, but actually his most important work was on the maturation and growth of, of, uh, of woody plant cells. Um, in, uh, older, in older plant cells, especially in the stem and the wood, what you see under the microscope and what was very easily seen by many botanists was that it has these spiral structures, these dots or these pits, um, and, and, that they, uh, and that they vary in shape uh, and appearance depending on how thick and how old the cell is. And botanists had actually spent 
about two decades arguing what the relationship between all these structures were, what order they formed, and what order they formed. Uh, so here is Mole speaking, writing in 1837. Again, to give you a flavor of this descriptive mode uh, in, in morphology. Quote, since we do not find the membrane originally fibrous and later homogenous in any cell, but because conversely the striations and the occurrence of fibers are the result of the further developments of cells, it follows that the organic substance is not uniformly deposited, but rather in particular places in greater or smaller quantities, such that if these irregularities reach a higher degree, then no organic substance will be deposited at all between the places at which the stronger deposition takes place, and these more intense depositions either proceed either in the direction of a spiral or in the direction of a net of events. Now, this is a 169-word German sentence that I spent quite a long time <laughs> translating, um, because it was very, which was very difficult. But you can get a sense of how much work is being put into not ascribing causes and not ascribing a mechanism to this development. Uh, this changed with two papers in 1844, one by Hugo Moll and the other by Karl. So I'll start with the 1844. Uh, with Mole's paper first. Um, in 1844, Mole found that if you put younger plant tissues in alcohol or acid for a short time and then stain it with iodine, one can identify a loose brown or yellow colored blobby object that is separated inside of the cell, sometimes still attached to the outer world. Additionally, when you apply acids uh, to fully grown plant cells, and this was well known, what you get initially is that it separates into rings. And if you let it sit, sit in the acid for long enough, it will separate into lobes uh, with the rings embedded in it. What he argued in 1844 was a scheme of development by which a young cell consists of a solid membrane solid membrane at close to full size with what he called the primordial utricle or the primordial shock, lining the outside, lining the inner side of the young, of the young cell membrane. As the cell grows, uh, matures the cell, um, let's see, as the plant cell matures, the primordial deposits successive layers of woody material along the interior of the cell wall except at these points at which the primordial utricle is still attached to the outermost cell wall. That was his argument for how the cell matures, and that is his argument for, how the, for why the pits and the lobes of the cell wall material appears. In other words, Mole argued that the primordial utricle was the agent of cellular growth, that it was initially an inner lining of the cell wall it deposited the successive layers of this woody cell wall material, retreating inwards as it did so. The primordial utricle, in other words, was a small part of the cell that, in its organismal context, was responsible for creating the bulk mass of the whole plant or even the whole tree. At the same time, as Mole published his primordial utricle theory, the botanist Carl Nagling developed the theory of cell division that specified a, what he called a schleim, as the, as the agent inside of the cell. Whereas earlier, Mole had suggested that the partition basically just grows inward in uh, cutting the plant cell in two, Nagley, by contrast, argued that the interior schleim of the cell creates this partition. The schleim inside of the cell first constricts, or sometimes even divides completely, completely at the site of the constriction, Sorry, and at the site of this constriction, the living slime deposits cell wall material. So this is passage 11. So note that he's going to describe parts of the contents of the plant cell as alive and parts of the plant cell, cell as either injured or dead. It often happens that a portion of the cell contents is so injured that it becomes incapable of performing further functions. Then, that portion of the living layer of mucus, the Lebenskräftige Schleimschicht, contracts into the new independent hole and completes its membrane. 
that dying cell contents lie outside this restored cell. So in this diagram on the left, here are the dying cell contents. Here are the living cell contents, and it is depositing a new cell wall around itself to close itself off from the, uh, from the dying, injured, and path potentially pathological cell contents. Right? Um, let's see. Indeed, in Nagley's general language, uh, sorry, as with everyone else I've mentioned so far, Nagley's illustrations are highly schematic and argumentative. What is also interesting in the novel is that Nagley claimed to have observed filamentous algae in a kind of serial observation, and this is passage 12. So he claims to have observed that, quote, each secondary cell contains in its center a round and transparent space of the nucleus. The cell, contents, the cell contents consist of a nearly homogeneous and colorless slime. So that's number 13 here. After a few days, this acquires a green color and granules. At this point, it also becomes clear that the septa, dividing the two cells, did not proceed from the parent cell, but were produced as parts of each particular daughter cell in the interior of the mother cell. In, the, in Nagley's general language, we find remarkable and repeated indications that the cell has slime that is endowed with vital power in contrast to the parts of the cell that do not. Um, a year later, Mole raced to try to catch up with Nagley's observations and revise the cell division scheme, making it very clear that, yes, it is the interior primordial utricle that constricts the rest of the cell, and that the outermost cell wall or the cell membrane is formed by the primordial utricle as it's developing. Right? Um, as he later wrote, it was not until I had discovered the primordial utricle that I was able to trace accurately the processes in the formation of this dividing cell. Uh, sorry. Finally, in, in 1846, Mole recognized that his primordial utricle was more or less the same as Nagley's slime or slime shaped, but Mole complained that the word slime was too ambiguous. It was a word that was, had too many popular and other scientific connotations, so instead he proposed the word protoplasm to distinguish this special living substance from the other non-living substances in the cell. This is passage 13. Since this viscous fluid precedes the first solid formations that indicate the future cells wherever they are to be formed, since we must further suppose that it supplies the material for the formation of the nucleus in the primordial utricle, and that these are both the closest in the closest spatial connection with it, and also react in an analogous way to iodine, that therefore its organization is the process with, that in, initiates the formation of the new cell i.e. cell division, in light of these physiological functions, I trust it is justified if I propose to designate this substance by the word protoplasma. Finally, it was these botanical terms that Robert, that Robert Remach turned to in the 1850s in an attempt to convince anatomists that division was also the rule for anatomy. In 1852, for example, he attacked, uh, he, attacked Schleibitz, sorry, he attacked Schwann's free cell formation, first by noting work by Mole and Nagley in plants, and then deploying their agents as well, the primordial utricle and the protoplasm, to argue that the cells, animal cells, also divide, <coughs> also multiply by division. So this is passage, passage 14. The furrowing of the egg is the first example of endogenous cell formation, which is based on the fact that after division of the nucleus, the protoplasm divides together with the inner membrane, prebioschlauch, without the participation of the outer cellular membrane. That he has, in other words, taken the developmental schema that Mole and Nagley introduced in 1844 to 46 and transported it to animals as an attempt to convince anatomists that cells divide. So, some concluding thoughts. Um, 
Now, I know my title, I think epigenesis is a bit broad because epigenesis means something more than just vital forces and coagulation. But I do think there's something really important that's happening in the 1840s. Very, something very important about these claims that protoplasm or the Schlein is, structuralist, uh, is a structuralist, unorganized substance that is itself alive and active and back to which all biological processes can be traced. 18th century epigenesis, epigeneticists would have rejected this idea outright. In fact, there is a big convincing scholarship that has shown that biology as such and the concepts of the living and life itself owed their existence to the, to the study of the body as a whole and the parts that constitute it. We read in 1801 in Bichat's General Anatomy, for example, I don't know if you can re read this back there, but so this is the English version. There are in nature two classes of beings, two classes of properties, two classes of sciences. The beings are either organic or inorganic, the properties vital or non-vital, and the sciences physiological or physical. Animals and vegetables are organic, minerals are inorganic. Now we have a different notion of what organic and inorganic means today, thanks to the success of 1820s and 1830s organic chemistry, which is the chemistry of living substances. In the German, it says, there are in nature two classes of two classes of things. Es gibt in der Natur zwei Klassen von Wesen, zwei Klassen von Eigenschaften, zwei Klassen von Wissenschaften. Die Wesen sind organisiert oder unorganisiert. Die Eigenschaften vitale oder nicht vitale. The things are organized or unorganized, the properties vital or non-vital. The sciences physiological or physical. The animals and plants, die, die Tiere und Pflanzen sind organisiert. What man calls minerals are unorganized. To what is this organization owed? How is this organization caused, repeated? These are the questions that 18th century epigeneticists and 19th century biologists were supposed to solve. Cell division, cell theory, and protoplasm theories did not solve the problem of how the whole organism unfolds. Unlike 18th century epigenesists, I think neither cell theory nor cell division nor protoplasm theory will be meant to answer that question. Rather, we see in this moment that what qualifies as a developmental cause has changed. 18th century epigeneticists were supposed to invoke forces, ends, or adaptations. Protoplasm and cell theory in the 1840s would invoke material constitutions and material processes. I might even go out on a limb to argue that a more diffuse cultural materialism that took hold in 1840s Europe had much to do with an increasingly robust or at least more confidence in matter theory than had been in the case, the case in the 18th century. And that what we see in the see that, that we see this confidence in matter theory reflected in the dry technical work of Moll and Rigby and Riemach at the threshold of empirical research. And again, so this is, I get to show you my vacation photos. Uh, this is at the Natural History London in, right before COVID, traveling right before COVID. Uh, it was really funny. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this, whatever it is, asks, what are we made of? And the answer at the Deutsches Museum in Munich, you are chemistry. La vie. C'est um, la vie, c'est la chemie. Mm -hmm. Right? And I would argue that this is a product of the 1840s. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, comments? I still have uh, difficulties to understand exactly what is the protoplasm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so, correct me. They put cells in acid, they see that some part dies, or, or coag it's already dead. It's coagulates. Okay. okay. Yep. Coagulates. <laughs> it separates off. It separates off, and they say, okay, what's, what's, what stays there, what is still around, must be 
the mother of everything or the, the cause of life or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And if they do it in acid even longer it goes how how could so how did they understand that stuff? So what I'm trying to note here is that the process by which we get away from this old explanatory schema where we rely on forces or forces or ends. The, the, the structure of the argument is that you put, you, you put this in acid. You see this thing that you haven't mm -hmm. been able to see before. Yes. We've known about this. I'm just going to argue that this creates this. Okay. Here is what this organ. I have found a new part of the plant cell. Okay. I argue that it's, okay, okay. it's the thing that does this. So That's the it. acid is like a revelator. It's it's and it's not. It's not Okay. And like this doesn't happen in nature, right? That's the interesting thing about the, all of this. This only happens by artifice. Mm -hmm. But what you do is that you look at this artificial formation and you say, this was here before. Yeah, and in its natural state, here's what it looked like, here's why you couldn't see it before, and this is what it does. And this is a lie. And this is the living part of it. It's not living. Okay. Thank you very much for that really, really interesting talk. Um, so I'm, I'm really struck by uh, how you, you know, you characterized um, Genesis on the one hand, which appeals to these sort of transcendental vital forces, and then a more, uh, and then a, a kind of picture that's. Um, more familiar to a, 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 a modern ear, right, which would be this uh, sort of matter theory. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm especially struck by that because I wonder, you know, I think uh, certainly in the case of, uh, well, okay, so I, I wonder if um, actually you see both of those kinds of ways of thinking at play in the work of Isaac Newton. Um, and, uh, so I'm specifically thinking of uh, the optics, mm -hmm. where he's thinking about, he's doing matter theory, but he's wondering how active principles feature into matter theory. Um, and sometimes he thinks maybe they're super added, sometimes he thinks maybe they're actually inherent to the matter. Um, and so, so, so clearly the, we have a, more of an applied matter theory in terms of biology, but I'm wondering if you see uh, Newton and the Cambridge Platonists as, as kind of playing an intellectually ancestral role to this. So interestingly, it has nothing to do with the Cambridge Platonists. It has to do with the French and Dutch Newtonians. Mm. Um, <clears throat> in the famous German preformation versus epigenesis debates, uh, Albrecht Haller trains in the Netherlands, and Karl Friedrich Wolf trains with someone who studied in France. Right? And so you have very direct lineages of the Newtonian of the, the, the Newton of the optics yeah. and Cartesianism taking hold in the, the arch preformationist of his time, Albrecht Haller, debating endlessly the same empirical observations with his rival, Caspar uh, Friedrich Wolff, right, who very directly learns a kind of, uh, uh, learns his physics from the Newtonians of the Principia, right? It's kind of amazing that people have been able to trace these kinds of influences, but it's right there. Um, and uh, Holler, you know, we do know about Holler's, uh, Holler's background. We can also say that, yes, this was also a Cartesian this was all, preformation was also derived from Cartesian ideas as well. It's very, very clear. Sean. Yeah, um, very cool. Um, I wanted to ask about, how to put it? There's this funky undercurrent of agency type talk that yes. runs around through here. And I just wanted to ask you to like riff on this a little bit because I think this is really interesting. And 
I kind of don't know what to do with it, and I've never really known what to do with it in these kinds of contexts. And so, yeah, like, help me know what to do with it. In this context, it just means this is the thing that does the thing. This is the cause, right? Um, there's all sorts of this new materialist hand wavy stuff that mm -hmm. I've gotten really into and I'm very have become very familiar with it, and I do think there is a strong reason why one should claim that matter has agency or has an active and less than sorry more than just a passive role in anything. Right? But what we see here is the appearance of agency talk and causation talk in the 1840s in strong contrast <coughs> to a, the impulse to get all of it out at the expense of your own intelligibility. Right? That long passage by Mulberry is like torturously describing the development of the plant cell without positing what's causing it, what's doing what, what are the mechanisms. Uh, that's hard to write. It's hard to write like that. And it becomes easier to posit that something is active. And Claude Bernard, for his many faults and his many, for his many shortcomings, he identifies this in the language of agency, right there. The agent de right? It's, it's, so what I make of it is they're saying, oh, this is the part that does the stuff. Everything else, but this is especially important in uh, plant anatomy, that this is the part that is alive and does everything that you're interested in as a physiologist, and this stuff has been created by the living stuff. Right? The plant cell wall itself is not alive. The cell contents are alive. Even though if you're a botanist, you do study the whole thing. It is a whole system but one part of this is alive. And botanists are the only people who still use the word protoplasm today. You also hear this term protoplast, that is a legacy of, uh, of this 19th century context. Uh, follow up on this, actually. Is the, isn't the term agent or agent also used in a, in a chemical sense. So not in the sense of uh, being an acting entity, but in the sense of being chemically active or having um, a chemical power to transform other uh, chemical stuffs. Um, I mean, that's, I guess that's an old sense of the term agent. It's still sometimes used. Well, it's used reagent. So re reagent, re reagent, a reagent. Right? is a, is a mm -hmm. very common term in today's chemistry mm -hmm. um, and was common in the 19th century as well, uh, or reagent. Um, whether, I don't know if Bernard is, so in this particular passage, I don't think he's talking about this in purely chemical terms mm -hmm. because uh, in the, somewhere in between these three dots, here he does talk about chemistry. And he doesn't talk about the agency of chemistry or, or chemical agency in that technical sense. He really is expand, ex talking about protoplasm in this expansive way. Let me follow up the follow up. But then that, but then that opens up an interesting question, right? So for these authors, what is the relationship with chemistry at this point? So I think it is worth seeing that the biologists come up with this active, that this part of the matter is active. They, they make this big change in their own understanding of matter theory, practically without any input from chemistry. And in fact, Mole will explicitly argue chemical we, you know, Biologists do not understand chemistry, and chemists do not understand botany. We must erect a strong barrier <laughs> between them. But nevertheless, he's able to talk about matter 
and make these modifications to matter theory, then everyone else will also say, well, yeah, sure, but the chemistry is there, we're gonna go there anyway. Right, so chemistry, the chemistry of a living matter, the structural chemist, the physical chemistry of living matter starts very soon after this. So I'll ask one. Still on, on this quote of, uh, of Foubert, what it wasn't, of course you're absolutely right that agent of life is a very strong, very strong expression, but not just it's or the matter of the ideal alive being, not, not the matter of life or the matter of the ideal alive being. So, so it must be, it's why he says it's common to every, every different form, a specific form of life? So Bernard and Haeckel also, but unlike some of the more radical physiologists, will say that every living organism has a form mm -hmm. also. Uh, this is, so this is in a paper I peer reviewed recently and should come out in the next some months. Um, Bernard, <coughs> Bernard, in this, in this particular moment, is trying to separate the sciences of physiology and morphology, or at least try to understand what the relationship of these sciences are. And he will say, the science of protoplasm is the science of chemistry, it's the science of mechanisms, it's the science of material processes. And the sciences of form are inductive, they're based on laws, they're not based on experiments. Okay. Not just the science of diversity is yes. not experimental. Yes. Blah, blah, blah. Which was also true earlier. Okay. I mean, he's basically admitting to the fact that um, taxonomy, evolution, and development are still intractable to him as a physiologist. So there's this in, there's mm -hmm. this, this this tension in Bernard is really really fascinating. I'm really curious to see how this author responds to my peer review comments. <laughs> boy, that paper was rough. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's a super interesting feature for Bob. And Heckel also talks about this. Okay. Yeah. Can I follow up on that? So is Bernard at this point in time dead? Read what? <laughs> Oh, Bernard's dead. This was published posthumously. Okay. Uh -huh. so, oh, okay. okay. So, so when, is, when is Bernard saying that the physiology and morph and morphology are interactable to this, this, this uh, cannot cannot meet. Where they cannot meet? Yes. What, what, when is he saying? He simply he simply says that um, physiology, and by which he he means chemical and physical physiology, um, cannot apprehend why essentially the organism forms in this way. But when, when does it, the, his, uh, his question Dave. is when, around when, when, when he has the idea? Uh, 1870. Okay. okay, so it is. So in the, I guess the reason that I'm, I'm wondering about that is because this is <coughs> post Darwin's famous marriage of teleology and morphology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the great arbiter of the Joffrey Cuvier debate. So I'm, I'm just wondering if Bernard's like engaging with that at all. Yeah, yeah. He, he definitely is. Yeah. Okay. He is asking himself, where's the role? What is the role of physiology in all of this? Okay. And his conclusion is basically when he so this is again in the paper that I that I reviewed, not my own research, but when he writes in the 1860s, he's more optimistic about a meeting point between the two experimentally. By the 1870s. Um, he is not only quite ill, but he's more pessimistic. Okay. And the movie he's trying to make is to cleave it off okay. into a separate domain of science. Hi. Uh, could you explain a little about uh, in Bernard the notion of milieu? The milieu, yeah. Because uh, today they use Bernard milieu as some kind of uh, grandparents or grandfather of the boundary condition notion. And the idea of the a form that characterizes the, 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 the organism is very uh, is very based on the notion of the medium that is read today as 
constrict your sets. So, uh, an organism from some from some authors is like a contraction set of relations between particles or molecules. And I'm sorry, what between a, a constriction set of uh, interaction between molecules? Okay. They constrain. Uh, there is a mutual constraint between them, and that is what they think is a, a form. So, so I think that the idea of of a form that characterizes the, the organism in Bernard is basically the idea of boundary condition of conditions, internal and external boundary conditions. It's not it's not the, the form of like uh, ancient philosophy or the form like uh, no, he is very much talking about the whole organism. Mm -hmm. right. He is talking about a whole organism. Yeah. Right. Um, so, one thing to notice about the milieu interior is that the milieu interior is a static structure that he, that he can access as a physiologist using chemical and physical tools. Um, and he's saying, you know, we can study form in these ways, like we study matter. We can we can st we can study the physiology of the organism in these ways, but why does the organism have the shape that it does? What are those causal relationships? He will say, I may be able to study the milieu interior. I may be able to say profound things about the maintenance of the organism, but I cannot explain using those tools the formation of that organism from a little stack. Right. He draws that line. Yeah. And that is exactly what the Alcubonesis uh, theorists try to do. So I would caution you by saying that Bernard is very useful to many philosophers, but you, the, if you read Bernard as a historical actor, right, he is engaged in a lot of issues that are not just him, but are part of the larger debate about what is the future of biology going to be, right? Even what is biology as such, um, which, so my boss, my boss argues that there's no such thing as biology. I beg to differ, <laughs> right? Um, but this is about the identity of which direction the life sciences are going to go in, and he is proposing, along with many other people at this point, that there are two directions for them to go to, and that some meeting will happen maybe in the future, but he is unable to see it. He is quite deeply pessimistic about this aspect of biology in the 1970s. We'll also say that the concept of the molecule is a very different, difficult one, and I've done some work on that. Um, if you read some of the people at this time, the word molecule is indistinguishable from Descartes' corpuscle. They still use that concept. Some people. Marcel? Yeah, just out of curiosity, um, I, mean, I don't know much about this period in, in the history of biology, so, um, but I, I, I've looked at um, Debates that start just a little bit later, namely the Driesch Ru versus Ru debate about uh, um, um, vitalism and um, the mosaic theory of development and preformation and epigenesis. Actually, I'm just curious how, how do you get from, from, from the, the sort of um, camps that you've drawn out, so the organizationalists versus the Schleim theorist, if you, if you allow me. <laughs> how, how, how do you get from that debate to, to the, 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 the Wu uh, Driesch debate? Yeah. Which so, so essentially what Driesch is saying is matter theory is no longer adequate to explain what I think needs to be explained. Right? So for me, this is not about chemistry can actually explain x, y, or z. Mm -hmm. 
but it has a lot to do with your confidence that matter theory is the domain in which you must answer these questions. And Driesch was, will come along and say, no, matter theory is not the domain in which we can answer these questions. And uh, frankly, I think at that moment, he's probably right. Um, one of my big arguments is that it is through these kinds of technical explorations of what is happening under the microscope as you stain and fix your preparation samples that biologists are learning what's possible to think about in chemistry and physics. Um, and when the Driesch root debates are happening, it's getting quite challenging, and biologists are having a hard time keeping up with what physicists and chemists are making available to them. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, other questions? I think there's one. Yeah, sorry. Um, you tempted us to ask you about walls versus membranes. Oh, sure. I want to ask you about walls versus membranes. Sure, sure, sure. Because that's a really interesting, yeah, yeah. There's almost this idea, I mean, the way you laid it out, it almost sounds like there's a sense at this point that the walls, in some sense, really don't belong to the cell yeah. right now. So, um, where to start? <laughs> uh, if you look in the literature, so the first time someone makes the distinction between the plant cell wall and the plant cell membrane, do you want to guess? Later than I think, I'm guessing. Does anyone want to guess? 1877. Okay. Right? Hmm. I don't know what you were guessing. Right? But that distinction has to be made. And before that distinction is made, the terminology is interchangeable. Partly because um, membrane, I think mem membrane is a Greek-ish term and wall is a Germanic term. Mm -hmm. And so in many languages, they become interchangeable depending on how sophisticated one wants to sound, <laughs> right? And in 1877, Wilhelm Pfeffer says, no, the wall is a rigid structure and he does the famous osmosis experiments to determine that a membrane composed of anything, which is soft, can be responsible for developing uh, somewhere between oh, what? at least six atmospheres of pressure with a 1% sure resolution. I think I have those numbers wrong. And on this basis, he analogizes that the plant cell must also have a membrane, right? That a membrane is essential for osmotic function, um, and that the wall is necessary to keep that osmotic function from essentially blowing the plant cell up, which is what would happen with six atmospheres of pressure. Um, <clears throat> that's, I wrote an article on this. OK, yeah. OK. Um, it's quite a it's quite a journey, and it has a lot to do with the status of analogy in biological argument. Whether you can analogize between physical experiments and biological structure. Um, the the membrane as we know it is a is a lipid bilayer with some stuff around it that has a thickness of six to twelve nanometers. The resolution limit of the microscope. Oh, the optical microscope, just in pure physics terms, is 250 nanometers. So what was the object that they were calling the membrane before electron microscopy? Well, it was just whatever was on the outside. And in 1860, with protoplasm theory, the bi many of the anatomists knew this, and therefore argued that the membrane is an optional accessory to the cell, to, to the proper Yeah. You mean that it's not visible in plant cells, because in animal cells it is. No, it's not. No, it is. The, the, me the membrane. The membrane. The, the lipid bilayer membrane with its attendant parts 
you well, will. You just see it as too little, too little. Um, what you're seeing, lines. if you're seeing two lines, yeah, in, two an lines optical, yeah, in an optical microscope, yeah. that is a that is an illusion created by the three dimensional structure of the cell under those physical conditions. Resolution wise, that those two lines are impossible to see under the optical microscope. Okay. What you're seeing, so there was this question about essentially bubbles, right? There was a, like, does a little bubble on, on a microscope slide, does that have a membrane? Is that a membranous structure or is it simply a pocket space? Right? Because it looks like there is a structure there. Um, and depending on your, when you're pointing to in physical chemistry, yes, there is a structure there. But that is an atomic structure. You are not seeing the membrane, you are seeing the optical effects of the def of the refraction, of the change in refraction, the change in refractive index between the cell and the surrounding medium. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of wild. <laughs> but you would see a lot of the same thing with just a drop at the water. So yes. I want to, in the previous slides, there was protoplasmic, but there was a, what, what was I? There was the expression protoinic, pro Protein contents? Yeah, protein content. What, what, at that period, what they had in mind when they said protein contents? I'm a little unsure. Okay. I do know they mean nitrogenous contents. What exactly they mean? I would actually have to go back to the German to make sure if he's yeah. saying protein or eyewise. Because, but it's just an impossible word to translate. Mm -hmm. The word protein is coined by Jan Gerrit Mulder, I think in 1836. Mm -hmm. What he means by protein and what we mean by protein are obviously worlds apart, but I don't actually know what exactly. those gradations what, what are. They, they that they are. Okay. Thank you. Or whether whether they think there's one protein or many proteins. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, this is a whole yeah, this is a whole thing that I'm trying to plural yeah. contents. Yeah. So there's no more questions. Let's thank our speaker and the